hello been a while since we've seen each other um mainly the reason for that is just straight up i've been too depressed quarantine's gone to me like first i feel like i'm short of breath today like my health's deteriorating like crazy so if you hear a lot of in sentences that's why i just feel like shit and um because of that, I just haven't felt the motivation to watch any movies, let alone find the passion to talk about one in particular. And so, the times I've mustered up in the past few months, the ability to watch a movie, um, I'll be talking about all the movies I've seen over the past few months. That's, that's what the title's for. Kind of like in the way Half in the Bag does their summer movie catch-ups once in a while. That is basically what this episode is. It's just me talking about all the movies I've seen for the past few months. None in particular in super detail, just all in a general sense. Some I may talk about more than others, but none would warrant their own episode. At least right now, I just do not feel the motivation to do so. But I have been wanting to do a podcast episode. I just haven't found the reason to until right now I decided why all those movies you did want to talk about but didn't know how to, why not just do a whole episode talking about all of them? And so yeah, that's what this is. This is a rather unconventional episode. Um, so we're still going to follow format, of course. So what have I been up to? <laughs> well, like if this is a game of catch-up that we're playing on this episode, then I suppose I should bring it back to the beginning. Um... So, since the last time I've checked up with you guys, uh, I, I guess, gaming-wise, where we can really start is Ghost, no, 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 that's where we end, fucking idiot, we, uh, we started The Last of Us Part 2, this was, it should have been my most anticipated game, but for some reason I just could not care, I'm just like, what, I, I guess it was because I kind of just expected it to be a masterpiece, I'm just like, I, I'm ready for when it comes out. But then the leaks happened, and I'm like, oh, no. And, well, I didn't actually read all the leaks. I just saw that Joel dies. And, um... Pardon me. <sighs> Jesus Christ, everything's trying to let out. And I just saw the negative reaction, so like, oh god, if th all these people are mad, then something's terribly wrong. And then the game comes out, and I play it, go, well, I guess a lot of the hate came from little man-baby bitches who were, oh, Joel died, what an inherently awful thing, I can't support this gamer, oh, Abby is trans, Oh, I hate her, but like, I'm assuming they purposely misgender her, but like, she's not trans, so I don't know where that came, I guess just because she's muscular, so really like, it was vile people who really fueled the initial hatred for the game, so I just ended up hating because it's a bad game, like, a bad story, I didn't care much for the gameplay loop. People say, oh, I, I didn't like this story, but this is an excellent game. I, I may not agree with 98% of the choices the story made, but oh boy, I sure love collecting things in all these wide-ass environments and just sneaking around and sneak around and... Oh, sneak around the clickers, throw a brick this way, walk this way, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat for over 20 hours. Like, it was bearable in the first Last of Us because it was a good story. But when you don't iterate on the gameplay and only give us a far worse story, then it was an actual chore to play through. So I do not think it's a good game in any respects. Like, there's good things about it, but... It's not a good game as a whole. Like, I'm sorry. I just, fuck it. I'm not going to get into it. I already did a whole rant about that. Anyway, so, um, next. Okay, and what sucks is that I bought the special edition of the game. So, 
It's not like I can return it or any shit like that. Or somehow get my money back. And something I just realized is that I've bought every PS4 exclusive that's come on 2020. The special editions for them. I don't know how this happened. I swear to God, this was an accident. <laughs> I have, of course, the Final Fantasy VII Remake Collector's Edition. That I pre-ordered since last fucking June because for some reason it was only $40 to, or like $50 to pre-order compared to the MSRP of 80 So I got a steal on it almost a year before it came out. And then I got Last of Us Part 2 because that was a game that I was going to buy either way. So I'm like, may as well get the special edition while I can. I got the Persona 5 Royal Steelbook a couple months after it came out. Thought I got a good deal on it. But then literally a week or two later, everywhere started selling it for $10 less. Even fucking GameStop at one point randomly was like, we're going to sell you the Steelbook edition and a Funko Pop for $40. I don't even like Funko Pops, but it's such a fucking good deal. I was so mad when I saw that. And then I got the Neo 2 special edition because I found it for half off brand new. And that's way too good of a deal. $40 for a new game and it's season pass and a steel book and a mini art book. Like fuck yeah, of course I'm going for that. And then of course, most recent release Ghost of Tsushima special edition i got that because that was actually my most anticipated game for the moment's been released because an open world samurai game that scratches the itch that assassin's creed was supposed to because everyone was asking oh why can't we get an assassin's creed set in china or oh an assassin's creed set in japan like just some type of like ancient setting in an ancient region people wanted What's up, MMMCV25? How's it hanging? Thank you for following. Uh, good shit. Stick around. Anyways, um, so yeah, I, I purchase, or I pre-order based off of the fact that this is my most anticipated game, and it's a PS4 exclusive, so I want the special edition, because I like steelbooks. Fuck me, right? And that's how I got that. And yeah, I've, I'm going through that currently. Um, it It's not like a overwhelming open world the way Ubisoft games are to the point they want to stop playing. But it's way bigger than I thought it'd be. It just seems like there's so much busy work. I'm like, this all feels important, so I should do it. But the game swears only this is, but it they always have everything else on the way to the main thing. So I just end up doing everything, and it's it's so overwhelming, you know? And I, I like the game, don't get me wrong. It's one of my favorites of the year. Still debating on if it's my game of the year, because I do have a lot of problems with it. Because I don't see it getting past an 8 out of 10 for me. It just, there's so many glitches. There's so much lacking in the direction like for trying to be a film bro game i mean they literally have a kurosawa mode they literally went to his estate to get that shit going so you really think like they would put more effort into making it seem like a film because a lot of the dialogue cutscenes with just normal npcs around the world is wide shot wide shot wide shot medium shot medium shot and it's so bland and the actual cutscenes, like in the very beginning, they're beautifully directed. So they just didn't put in the... Yes, uh, it is, as in Akira Kurosawa mode, because in case you don't know, what it does is it essentially makes the game in black and white. And it adds like this film grain filter on it, so there's lots of, you know how like in when you're watching a movie and film you see like scratches of black and like popping and it looks really fucking nice and they even went the extra mile to change the audio mixing so that it'd be mono instead of stereo so it sounds like something like the game was recorded in the 50s when one of his films would have been released so like that's why i'm talking but they put so much effort into trying to make it feel like a movie in that sense but they just didn't do enough with it with the whole game like, the cutscenes, their big cutscenes, are very well directed. 
but just in general, just talking to NPCs and shit, which is like 80% of the game, is so bland and stiff. It, it just comes off lazy, like, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, exactly, it looks fucking great. It is great. It's so much fun to play, and especially so much fun in photo mode. And that photo mode alone is basically what makes it such a pro film bro game. And that's why it resonates with me so much. So, yeah, long story short, that is what I've been up to in terms of gaming. And <sighs> movies? We'll get into this. So first... On to the news, because uh, I guess I made that a segment, but the world's gone to shit, so I don't think movies are going to exist any in the near future. So the only news I have that's even worth bringing up is the Criterion Collection's October titles being announced. And the reason I think it's newsworthy is one in particular. So let's list off what we have here. I'm going to open up the site just to triple check that I get them right. So pardon me. Bear with me one segundo. All right. So wait, wait, wait. I don't want to accidentally read, overread. Okay, there we go. Oh, I forgot. In September, the Elephant Man comes out. Good shit. Anyways. So on October 6th, we have Pierre, Pierrot Le Fou from Jean-Luc Godard. Then we have Claudine on October 13th from John Barry. Then on October 20th, we have The Gunfighter from Henry King. October 20th as well, we have The Hit by Stephen Frears. And finally, arguably the most important one, the one that makes us worthy, of news is Parasite on October 27th. Yes, they announced earlier this year, may have been January or February, they're like, yeah, The Irishman, uh, Marriage Story, and Parasite, yeah, they're all getting Criterion releases. Yep. And we're like, oh, that's fucking great. When? And they went, y'all hear something? And then, soon enough, we found out Marriage Story is coming out and X day, we're like, cool. What about the others? And finally, we get, yeah, Parasite's coming out October. Cool. Where's Irishman? That is the one I'm excited for the most because of the fact that it's a Netflix movie, so you can't buy it physically until the Criterion version comes out. And I already own Parasite, at least digitally on 4K, so it's not. A massive priority but one really interesting feature in particular about this release is that it does come with the black and white version that I've been really wanting to watch for so long now since I found out about it so very excited very excited to get that one day like I said not high on my priorities but one day we're also gonna get the Irishman Criterion release announcement you're not going to hear the end of me with that one. No, sir. No, sir. How do you feel about stuff? Dude, I have no script. Fucking ask me. Seriously. You're the only one here. This is going to be the most intimate podcast experience you have. Oh, fuck you, son. Theaters? Hell yeah. I fucking envy you. I... <laughs> While you ask your question, I'm just going to tell a quick tangent of my first time watching Parasite. I was on a plane on the way to India for a study abroad trip in December. I was sitting on a plane in the middle of the ocean eating this fancy ass German airline food, sipping white wine, watching this class as a movie, <laughs> and I went... On this tiny, not HD screen, I'm just like, oh, I'm doing this wrong, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> and so just see, yeah, I watch it black and white in theaters. Like, <laughs> shut up, asshole. You didn't get the real film bro experience <laughs> watching it on a plane drinking white wine. <laughs> 
Bong Juno's rolling in his grave right now, and he's not even dead. <laughs> okay, so listen. Uh, at the time, it did not release in theaters, at least in a limited release. But as soon as the Oscar nominations got announced, I worked at, like, the biggest theater in Illinois around that time. Like, a few months ago. God, the before times. And, um, they played Parasite literally to the day everything closed in mid-March. Like, that Knives Out and probably 1917 just did not stop playing for months so I've seen the last 20 minutes of Parasite on the big screen more times than I can count. It looked great. <laughs> so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to buy it because they didn't have a physical 4K release. So I'm like, I'm going to buy it digitally, but the 4K version. So I watched it in 4K at home. Fantastic. But now we're going to get the Criterion release. Not going to be in 4K. Could it be mastered in 4K? Cut down to Blu-ray. That's fine. But we get the black and white version. I can finally watch that at home. My country parasite was in the theater. Oops. Release date for like eight. Yeah. Exactly. Like Parasite was just a major thing. Like people forget how much of a culture phenomenon it was around the Oscar buzz, the Oscar nomination really boosted it up, but it went astronomical when it won. So many old people were like, what's that movie that won the Oscar? I'm like, Parasite? But yeah, probably. Like, they didn't even know the name, but it's so well known that they just knew Parasite was the big thing. And so I'd sell them a ticket, and then they'd come back saying, ah, I, I didn't like it. Okay, where can I get a refund? I'm like, well, you just came from where you're supposed to. Go back upstairs. Go get your refund. They're like, I, I, I didn't know it was a uh, 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 foreign movie. I don't like reading subtitles. I went, oh, brother, <laughs> here we go again. Yeah, honestly, though, at the end of the day, watching it on a plane is the only way no very specifically my setup is very specific to the aesthetic parasite stylistically is very minimalist in terms of like its color palette its architecture and stuff it's very intentional by design very modern so what better way to watch it than with the fancy little thing your little bread roll and butter. You got your white wine and your tiny little cup. And you're sitting there. <sighs> and I shit you not, my laptop screen might be two or three times the size of the screen I watched Parasite on for the first time. But anyways, long tangent short. Well, you said you were going to ask something. Uh, Go ahead, ask away. Usually I do a Q&A section at the end, but... Who gives a shit? This is actually creating quite engaging topics because this gives you way more to talk about in the news section than I thought it would. I thought I'd just be like, yep, Parasite's coming out. All right, moving on. <laughs> I also watched it with my parents and mom said, why did you kill the rich guy? Just take a shower. Okay, speaking of, yeah, I don't know why people were so confused. My little sister asked, why did he kill the dad? And I'm like, what? Did you not watch the movie? The, 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 the smell thing. The smell thing set, set him off like an animal. <sighs> well, it's not. Well, I guess it is technically you lagging, but that's just how, um, that's how Twitch works. It, it takes forever. Like, I'm talking. And then what you see is so delayed, so then I don't see what you're saying until you say it. 
Yeah, it, the ending is not confusing at all. And then this one girl who was in a friend group I see part of, she um reaches out to me. She's like, hey, uh, uh, how can I watch Parasite? I really want to watch. And she comes from the kind of friend group that, like, they're trend chasers to the absolute maximum. So they just, whatever's popular, they have to do. Oh, the Starbucks in Chicago's opening. We have to go to and take pictures, clinking cups. Oh, Parasite's the big movie. I have to see it. So one of them reaches out to me asking how to watch. I'm like, well, funny enough, I just actually bought it digitally. I give you my login code and or login info, and you can watch it. Go ahead. And so they watched it, and they texted me saying, yeah, I really liked it, but the ending was it was so confusing. I'm like, what? He killed the, 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 the lower, lower class kills from the low class, which then kills the high class. It's all parasitic. What's there not to get? It's so straightforward. What is confusing about that? But she is very much the kind of person who would be confused by Memento. I could see that. Wait, what? I thought that happened. Wait, when did this happen? I'll never forget. I had an ex who told me. she. I think she tried impressing me by saying this. But she said she had a... When she watched Memento, her and her friends had to have a journal to keep track of everything. I'm like, bro, let me... I can draw in the air. Let me set this down. I can draw in the air exactly the structure of Memento. They converge. Forward. Backwards. Like. I, I swear to God. I swear to God. I try. It's difficult. But I nonetheless try to not come off as a film asshole. But I swear to God, it feels like I'm surrounded by idiots all the time. I'm like, am I crazy? Do I just look down on people? Is that why I'm always angry? Or is everyone actually stupid? Like, this is why I hate Christopher Nolan. Oh my God, I'm going, I don't even give a shit, dude. This is a random episode as is, but this is fun. Like, why do people look up fucking Christopher No look up to him as if he's oh this weird he's the epitome of high art to normies he's fucking Tarkovsky like Christopher Nolan is as artsy as normies will get and be I do commend his existence he is really him and Tarantino are like the last true real cinema auteurs, if you will, of mainstream cinema. Like their household names, people will go to see. And that I can respect the hell out of. I mean, I'm desperate to see Tenant, so I kind of fall under this category. But at the same time, he is not the epitome of cinema to me. I don't like Interstellar. I don't like Memento. I don't like Inception. I think Dunkirk's pretty good. I like the Batman movies. And it, I'm just tired of people glorifying him to this unbearable degree, especially Inception. But yeah, exactly. You say, it's a fucking Nolan film. It's not rocket science. Like, Dunkirk. One week, one day, one hour. Not gonna lie, it does take a bit of muscle in the brain to follow in real time what's going on. You can piece it together if you just take some time to think, oh yeah, I've seen that before. Just a little. It, it, that to me, Dunkirk is the one that makes you have to pay attention the most. Oh, you hate Dunkirk? Well, fuck. I, I, I think it's 
a fantastic horror movie. People call it a thriller, but that is a fucking horror movie. I wanted to vomit the whole time I watched it. was a fantastic experience to watch in cinema. It is oh, such a great experience. There is a lot I hate about it, though. I hate the lack of humanity in everyone. It just lowers the stakes to an unbearable degree. I think the only reason I felt stakes was because Harry Styles was in it and I wanted to make sure he was okay. That's literally, I think, all that carried the emotional stakes. I actually don't see clips of Inception on Twitter. The only clips I see on Twitter are of Now You See Me. Dave Franco goes... <laughs> People lost their fucking mind. That is... Dude, that is David Lynch to these bitches. <laughs> these locals will watch Now You See Me. Dave Franco go... Go, yo, what the fuck? Then go to Buffalo Wild Wings after. <laughs> Like, they go stupid crazy over fucking <laughs> the, these hoes love now you see me I, I think if I was ever desperate enough to get top I think I'd just go on twitter and tweet wow I sure love now you see me starring Jesse Eisenberg Dave Franco and Woody Harrelson it's my favorite high art cinema <laughs> anyways yeah. Long story short, Parasite's coming out on Criterion in October. So, let's, uh, for now at least, we can continue this in the Q&A section, definitely. Uh... Oh, shoot, hold on. He asked for a link, sorry. Wait. Are you the one watching this? Maybe you are. But just in case, I'm going to drop the link. Anyways. So, now we get into... <laughs> I sub here. <laughs> yeah, you right. <laughs> um, What have I been watching? I'm going to pull up my letterbox list because I review everything I watch. So... That's probably the easiest way to see. Um, let's see. Where do we begin? All the way to the start. Ooh. Not that far. Alright. I tried watching Fan Force Stick. Ben's older brother says, It's clobbering time. Before smacking him. I turn it off. <laughs> That's a half star. I rewatch Joker. It is absolutely far worse than I gave it credit for and I was already giving it a 4 out of 10 kind of credit that is a vile unwatchable train wreck blind spotting blind spotting is an excellent movie it is fresh it is lovely it is heartbreaking it's powerful Everything I want a movie to be. Love it. Oh, okay. So, I, as much as I want to talk shit about Joker, on my YouTube channel, I have a whole rant where I drunkenly talk about it in one take for 40 minutes. Maybe I'll take you up on that offer later. I just... Do not want to waste my passionate energy towards a movie like that. Yeah. But yes, watch Blind Spotting. It is phenomenal. And it's because of um what um a lot of digital especially Voodoo, which is where I get all my digital movies from. It's like the main platform to do so. Uh since the beginning of June They've been doing a lot of, like, movies about the black experience or from black filmmakers. They've been releasing those or doing a sale for those. So I bought Blind Spotting for $5, and I believe it's still $5 on Vudu right now. So instead of paying the $3 to rent it or whatever, I just highly recommend you buy it. 
even if you end up only watching it once, like it's still around the price of a rental. I highly recommend it. Um, Singing in the Rain. This is one I've been wanting to watch my whole life. I've known the song. Good morning, good morning. You know, because it's like a staple. It's an American classic. Everyone knows the words to the songs. <laughs> yes, my video for Joker was a better cinematic experience. I've rewatched it three times now. Not to brag or anything, but I, I make interesting enough content that I can actually look at old videos and just play them as podcasts and listen to them while I'm doing shit. Anyways, Singing in the Rain was something I've been wanting to watch my whole life because I know these songs. I know, good morning, good morning, and of course, I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain, just beautiful songs, and that Gene Kelly number of Singing in the Rain, the way he dances is so iconic. I've, I've been enamored with it for so long and I'm like I just never watched the movie I finally watched it it is as good as I wanted it to be that's it it's just perfect and I'm like yeah I expected that so I didn't I, I didn't leave watching the movie oh so ecstatic or disappointed I just it perfectly set my standards I love it. It's great. It's a five-star movie for me. I can't get enough of it. I abs So, you think I'd hate Singing in the Rain? <laughs> Baby, you, you don't know me. <laughs> Baby, let me tell you. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you. There is no champion for theater and mu- No, I hate theater. For musicals. There's no bigger champion for musicals than yours truly. I will champion musicals to the ends of the earth. The Prince of Egypt is a musical. One of my favorite movies of all time. I love West Side Story. I love a bunch of these. Mamma Mia 2 is in the top 30 greatest films of all time. No cap. Mamma Mia 2 is as close as you can get to capturing pure joy on film. The closest anyone will ever get. Even musicals from the 50s, from the golden era of musicals, will not be close to capturing the feelings I got from watching Mamma Mia 2. It is un believably incredible can't get enough of it okay you say I love it so much talking about singing in the rain I had an intro to Hollywood class in uni uh, I had an intro to class in uni yeah it was proper sorted yeah <laughs> sorry I didn't know anything about cinema so I was completely enamored oh wow so that's how you dive in head first fuck dude fuck that's good. For me, yeah, The Prince of Egypt is really the first movie I can think of, like, really young, that just threw me into my love for cinema as more than just a watching experience, like a higher art form. I was, I was four years old looking at the shot of the pharaoh standing with the big pharaoh head behind him, and it made me feel things like, whoa, he's powerful. My little brain couldn't con understand the concept of symbolism. I felt it, and that's how powerful that movie is. The ultimate cinematic experience is the warm, fuzzy feeling you get inside watching musicals. I, the ultimate experience? No. A experience? Yes. I believe the ultimate power and ex cinematic experience is when you watch something they immediately feel has changed your life like you see the world differently for it now once again musicals can do this they can 
make you have a more positive perception on love, life, and all things good. That falls under it, but it's not the thing. I see it in a more general spectrum of the possibilities that cinema brings. Like, First Reformed is one of my favorites of all time, just because of the fact that it complete... Like, I've known climate change is bad. Like, no shit. The world's dying. But that movie just brought this sense of immediacy and bleakness that won't, still won't let go of me. It is the bleakest movie I've ever seen, and it's so powerful. I could watch that any day. It just keeps aging like a terrible radioactive pool of fucking pollution and shit. Because just like, we're getting closer and closer to the to the planet just becoming a melting pot and that's why yeah I think ultimate movies that can change your life that's what it's all about anyways yes rewatch Prince of Egypt holds up even better than you remember (laughs) oh you want the serotonin yeah stick to musicals don't watch first or fourth Uh, (laughs) that's gonna be a bad time for you (laughs) all right next movie My Spy. So My Spy is a a movie that I just saw the poster for and was very curious. I'm like, this is just trying to be the game plan, isn't it? I love the game plan. It is an unreasonably good movie for what it is. It's almost great. It is like 6 or 7 out of 10. It teeters on being great, but just never quite gets that emotional reach that makes you teary-eyed. never earns a moment like that. One moment like that would have easily pushed into the upper echelon of greatness. My Spy doesn't get anything right. It is passable in terms of it's watchable, and that's the highest praise I can give it. It's bad. But it's watchable bad, so I gave it a 4 out of 10. And it's just not like... Anything, really. It's it's such an unpleasant experience. When it's so painfully and funny. There's one point where they're in a rest... Like, the mom of the... Who the... It's like... So basically the story is Dave Bautista works for the CIA. He's stuck on like watching this one woman and waiting to see if the bad guys come retrieve something from her. And she has a daughter. The daughter finds out early on that Dave Bautista CIA. So they have to work together to keep the secret or some shit. But then he ends up wanting to bang her mom. And at one point, they go on a date, and there's music, and she's like, come on, let's dance. He's like, I don't dance. And then he, (laughs) he whips, he nays. I'm pretty sure he flosses, but I kind of started seeing black. I, I blacked out. I don't remember that scene. It's quite traumatic. But that's all you need to know about this movie. It's like, I'm going to get the kids with the Fortnite dances. A lot of movies have been doing that. Sonic does that. I'm assuming others do, but I don't really watch kids' movies anymore. So, But the fact that two of the kids' movies I've seen in 2020 have Fortnite dances, I think we're in a sticky situation here, fellas. <laughs> not looking good. So that's my review. And not good. Now, the next movie I saw... Whoa, did I really watch one cut of the dead before the swap? I guess I did. Anyways. So. One cut of the dead. The less you know about it, the better. So all I'm going to say is, if you love movies and what goes into making them, Please, please watch One Cut of the Dead. It is, I cried at the end. 
Not because it's supposed to make you feel sad, but it makes you feel so fucking good and happy. It is such a beautiful movie and how simple it is. It's so lovely. I love it. I adore it. It is adorable. One Cut of the Dead. All I ever see when people talked about is the less you know going in, the better. And that's all I have to relay to you because it highly uh, heightened my um, experience in watching the movie for the first time. Because I generally did not know what it was about. All I knew is there's this like one long take in it. There is. It's really good. And then you realize what they do with it. And you're just like, oh. Fuck yeah, they look The Last of Us Part 2 this bitch. It's so fucking good. Holy shit, dude. I can't get enough of it. That's all I have to say because I, I don't want to say anything about it. Next, I feel like I watched these all like in one morning because after that I watched The Swap, which is a Disney Channel original film. This one's not a decom, this is a decoff. It's a film ass movie. This is something I've been trying to um, explore are the Disney Channel original movies that have come out since past my prime. So, basically, I stopped watching Disney Channel around the time, like, all the shows ended, like Hannah Montana and shit like that. Like, I basically grew up alongside these shows, so when they ended was around perfectly the time that I grew up out of it. So I was like, well, what, have, what have I been missing out on? So I've been watching a lot of them. Like, Zombies, the worst thing I've ever seen. We don't talk about that. But I want to talk about The Swap. This is a film that is about... So basically, there's this girl who's in twirl, baton twirling, comp, like on a competitive level for school or some shit. And there's a kid, a dude kid. He does hockey for his school. They're both good at what they do. Highly competitive sports, apparently. And, um... And, um... The, so... The... I'm trying to think. The girl's dad is absent in her life. The boy's mom died. So, you know, it's like... You can see how... There's a puzzle that could be connected there. So, what the movie really is about is... They switch lives. So, he takes over. It's Freaky Friday, essentially. But, instead of exploring a mother-daughter, it explores gender identity as a whole. And parenthood. Because these are deeply, like troubled kids who haven't properly dealt with the absence of their respective parents and so they're able to through the other person's lives that they're now living kind of come to terms with things because the way I looked at it is there's this um for people who experience PTSD there's this form of therapy that I don't know exacts because I'm not a therapist I, I don't claim to be the end all know all expert on what I'm talking about right now, but there's a thing where it kind of allows you to revisit your trauma through like VR. And that's why I feel like this movie in a way is it like forces each character to come to terms with their loss and their grief. And it's done so well. This whole movie is just oh, hilarious hijinks ensues from gender swapping. Like, oh, this this girl's got to figure out, ooh, I smell like that. Will boys smell? And you're like, ah, ah, ah I did that. <laughs> and then the, uh, the guy being the girl, you know, girls, oh, we have to deal with fake friends. We got to go act normal at the party. Ah, so quirky. But it actually, like, it never becomes cringe. It's actually all really well done. And it all builds up to each having their emotional climaxes, which to the film is like 
according the film's rules of how the swapping works is like fuck it doesn't matter fuck that shit the film's rules is like once they find what they're looking for then they're able to swap back to their normal bodies and the way they do it is by coming to terms with what they're missing which is closure and it's so i'm not gonna spoil how it's done but it's so beautifully done i i it's a phenomenal seven out of ten but there's still a lot of cringe elements to it like the coach of the girl it's baton team she's like the worst overacted like i i swear to god i've seen this bitch on um backstage not literally but like she just reeks the energy of someone they found on backstage.com and we're like all right well we couldn't find anyone to play a gym teacher you'll do and she's just vile i hated her she was so bitchy for nothing she looked down on the badminton team and the badminton team was like, hey that's not nice <laughs> that's actually the movie i wanted to come back to the podcast with weirdly enough i wanted to deeply talk about it because i think thematically it's so strong and it's so cool that a disney channel movie does it because usually they're super surface level with their themes just oh dad's at work all the time maybe they should spend more time with their kids is normally like 98 percent of the messages that they try to express in the movies but this one had a lot going for it like being comfortable with who you are like the side plot of the bully became super touching out of nowhere and it leads to the most ridiculous fucking MacGuffin. it's crazy this movie's crazy i absolutely adore it it's a lot better than most i've seen it's better than what before watching this i thought was my favorite newest decom movie which is like something about how to build the perfect boy or something like that i, I kind of like that one a lot too nowhere near as much as this one um next so teen beach movie is another decom that for years everyone hyped up they're like this is the shit that and lemonade mouth are two that i'd never seen I wish I'd never seen Teen Beach Movie. It is quite awful. I expected way more. But it is lame as fuck. They don't... Nothing makes sense. They don't follow their own world rules. Nothing... Like, I thought it'd be a really cool movie. Of, like, kind of commenting, commenting on existentialism. Like, I thought they'd have... They'd be forced to act out the movie. But then there's kind of a turning point where they, like get the characters to think differently basically the way i called it is pleasantville minus the weird racism stuff <laughs> and it, that's kind of what it is but it never reaches like takes full advantage of the concept because there's one point where they're going off script and everyone's looking at them differently it's like oh cool so this is where it's going but they just completely disregard them they do whatever they want anyways they never bother to act out the movie so they just it was kind of a whatever pointless movie i don't know why i even had that premise then if you're not going to follow through with it i hate teen beach movie I, I do not like it at all and so because of that i expect nothing from lemonade mouth so i'm never gonna watch that one fuck that shit fuck bridget mendler's vampire ass k9 teeth get that shit pulled out bitch god damn why am i so mean to bridget mendler she didn't do shit except be in a movie i never want to watch <laughs> Speaking of a movie I never want to watch, The Big Red One from Samuel L. Fuller. So, in one of my film classes, one of the coolest professors I've ever had, Professor Marsh, he showed us a lot of movies for the History of Cinema class, and he'd always show movies that no other professor would show. And one of the ones he we were supposed to watch at home was The Steel Helmet, which is another Fuller film. Did not watch it, of course. Who has time to watch movies in film school? Fuck that shit. And now I kind of wish I did. And so because of that, I'm like, well, I'd like to watch one of his movies because he does some World War II movies that relate to his experiences fighting in it. The Big Red One is very dated and how it's presented. The score, I hate 
war movie scores from like everything before the 90s is so overly patriotic in its score even though it's supposed to be a serious war movie it'll have it whenever soldiers are deploying every single time and you're just like ah oh, the tone deafness bro shit I don't really have anything to say about it. It's perfectly fine. It's watchable. But the movie I do want to talk about a little more is Attack. This is a film from 1956 directed by Robert Aldrich. Now, this is the name that sounded familiar to me because he also did The Dirty Dozen and the original The Longest Yard. Um, yeah, so he, he does things that are known. And Attack is another World War II movie, but what makes it unique is that it's actually based off of a play. So it's very intimate in its settings and very character and actor oriented. So it's really unique in the genre. And it's so incredibly well shot. It is magnificent. It's composition. It's use of black and white with shadows. Ooh, wee love it so much depth within the frames dog and like it's so bleak in its outlook on war that they actually could not get um military advisors to approve of work upon the movie or some shit like that basically you know how every movie with the u.s military has like their military advisors making sure don't talk too badly about us you hear like this movie apparently went too far for them back in 1956 about a world war ii movie and i i just love i love this movie four out of five stars for me they sprinkle in a little battle scene once every 40 minutes or something and it's fine but it's really the heart is in the characters and the drama that unfolds it's fantastic another musical i tried watching so fred astaire was like a huge name. Fred Astaire, Bing Crosby, Gene Kelly, Dean Martin, all these guys were known for musicals. I hate Fred Astaire. I can't stand his face. I can't stand his singing. I, I just can't stand this man. This motherfucker looked 50 years old since the day he came out his mom's vagina. Like, I, I hate this dude. I can't stand him. So I don't know what I expected from watching Royal Wedding. And I could not get through it. I think I only made it to the end of the first act. Before I'm like, you know, this is not for me. I deserve better. And so, the basically the way I can review it is, it's probably what Zoomers think all movies from the 50s look like, or are like. Because it's just so standard, so nothing. This is something you'd see on the background of a tv in a movie or a show that characterizes someone as oh they watch stuff from the 50s it's fuck it's fuck shit that's the only way i can describe it and the final movie i want to talk about before we just get into back to open conversation like we were earlier is a bridge too far this i just saw actually right before starting the podcast it is a fucking three-hour World War II epic that's about Operation Market Garden from multiple perspectives. It is great. It is phenomenal. The biggest problem and the only thing, the only flaw it has is so big that it makes it a 9 out of 10 instead of a 10. It says way too fucking long. If they trimmed 20 minutes off that bitch, it could have been perfect, but it's just too damn long it is actual work to watch that movie but i love it i love its extensive look at each perspective and the very end when they're all listing off reasons that the operation failed it's great because it shows like it doesn't matter why we failed like we all did our part in fucking shit up somehow this is a disaster from the beginning and look where we are now we didn't accomplish anything it's another great like show don't tell it shows how like 
its pessimistic view on the war and how pointless Operation Market Garden was. Love it. Okay. So that's me briefly just talking about every movie I've seen since. And now we can open up the floor to questions. Or maybe if you want, we can talk about Joker. I, I could be down for that. I, I could be down, but it's just like, after watching it again for the second time, I couldn't even finish it the second time, it feels like I have less to say because I just see how nothing the movie itself has to say. Like, what do you want me to say about it, Joaquin Phoenix? We live in a society, yes, I know, the rich are rich, the poor are poor the rich make the poor angry yes and mental illness we need to take care better care of the mentally ill uh huh And that that that's the whole movie stand up. Like it just says the most surface level shit and expects you to be like, yes, yeah, quite profound. Eat the rich. But in terms of just plot, it's so goddamn nonsensical watching it again. Because it's like Arthur kills two people. He was wearing clown makeup, so people are like Ah, he killed rich people in a clown mask. Therefore, the clown mask is a symbol of fighting the oppressors. It's just such a massive leap in logic. You're supposed to believe, oh, this city's desperate. Oh, the rich are crushing the poor. We must resort to drastic action to the point that we just take over the city. It's total xanarchy out there by the end of the movie. And this is in the span of like a few days probably. I don't know. but it's just... And Arthur is such a passive character. He kind of does things to advance the plot. But like the major things that are happening in the background, he has nothing to do with it it just happens to happen in the background so that the ending can happen like the things he does just the whole plot can be summed up with the vine of tuk, 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 and the little baby going up daddy and then the camera turns and she's like do i look like like that's that's the plot of joker he's like thomas wayne is my dad he's like no, I'm not. Fucker. And then he gets roasted on national TV. And then it's like, well, nobody's laughing now. And Robert De Niro's like, you could say that again, pal. And he just looks. <sighs> and that sets him to be a joke. You're like, okay. He dances down some stairs to a song by a pedophile. Okay. <laughs> like, it's just such a... Okay, movie. It's so awful. There's nothing to say about it. People are like, oh, it's so profound. It makes you think we live in a society. But no. And yeah, you're right. Even Joker himself says it's not political. I feel like that was just Todd Phillips trying to cover his ass so he wouldn't have to deal with any actual conversation about the film. So that line, having Joker say it's not political, only furthers my point that Todd Phillips literally had nothing to say. He wanted you to make sure you didn't have any thoughts coming out of it. Because it, it has no thoughts. Head empty. Head empty. Mm-hmm. I don't know, like, in my video, oh, 
That fucking monta dude. <sighs> that montage, man. That's when I was like, okay. Th this movie was made for general audiences. This wasn't trying to be some risky, grand, outdoor vision of art house interpretation of Joker. Like, no. It's fucking Joker. Everyone's gonna watch it. You just butchered Taxi Driver and King of Comedy, copy and pasted the homework, put Joker makeup on it, and said, buy it. It's Joker. It's bold. No. You just repackaged 70s cinema and made it bad. That's all you did, Todd. You could... Okay, so I can't say I saw it coming because the movie is so goddamn idiotic. I just had to take everything as it was and question it endlessly. What the fuck? Why? Why? So that is the only idiotic thing that gets explained away. She wasn't there. You're like, okay, that makes sense. Who would want to date someone that ugly? What about everything else, Todd? So, that's why I honestly did not see the twist coming, but I didn't care for the twist. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. You know? Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, he's not a reliable narrator. So, I initially, when I first saw the movie, I came out of the thinking, okay, everything happened. Duh. Because how would he imagine... Bruce's parents being killed that's what makes the Batman he could not imagine such a specific instance but then upon second watching I realized this is all so goddamn stupid it's not just everything towards the end and starting for the Zazzy Beats reveal and onward no everything is actually super idiotic to the point that only someone with the problems he has could come up with so i'm actually convinced that up to maybe like only the first maybe 20 minutes ish actually happened then beyond that i think it's all in his head and that would explain a lot more but it's still super shit you can hand me a plate and tell me, this is a platter of shit. I'll say thank you for telling me, but I still hate eating it. It doesn't make any difference that you're telling me it's shit and explaining it. Because you can see they're prepping for a major Tyler Durden reveal moment. I don't think I've ever fully finished watching Fight Club, so maybe that's why I didn't see it coming. But I didn't care enough to look out for these plot twists, so that's another thing. And, yeah. So it's like, the movie has nothing to say, so why the hell should I have anything to say about it? Like, what an insult to movies. The only positive of it breaking a billion dollars is that I hope they do more, like... How do character study DC villain movies the one wish I have is an Ari Aster no pardon me forgive me I can't believe I said those words Ugh. Robert Eggers directed Swamp Thing movie that it's all I want for Christmas ladies and gentlemen all I want for Christmas Simple as that. I just want Robert Eggers, a camera, a tripod, a dude in a Swamp Thing costume with some makeup, maybe some points for CGI tracking to get the gills breathing and moving. Make a character study. Make a horror character study. Go crazy. Ah, go stupid. That's the only positive I see out of this. 
because being surprised, oh, the Joker movie, the most recognizable villain of all time, the Joker movie did well. Bah. Who would have thought? That's like saying, hmm, what if we made a Jack Sparrow movie? All the Pirates of the Caribbean movies are Jack Sparrow movies. But what if we just made a spin-off called Jack Sparrow? Hmm, of the most popular character. Hmm, how would that turn out? Like, no shit. Well, okay, maybe in 2007 it'd be like, no shit, that'd be a hit. Like, this, making a Joker movie and trying to pass off as, oh, it's brave, it's all tour filmmaking. No. That is the safest thing you could do because without the Joker, it's just a, a fanboy of Taxi Driver and King of Comedy, but from someone who directed the fucking Hangover trilogies and Due Date. And war dogs. That that's all it is. Like And Tom Todd Phillips is such an insecure filmmaker and it was accidentally revealed when all this press talk was going around of how the movie is made. Like Joaquin Phoenix would walk off set because he just wasn't feeling the scene, wasn't feeling the takes. So they constantly had to rewrite the scenes. On set, like they'd openly brag about it, be like, Zazzy Beats would be like, Yeah, I'd go to the trailer with Joaquin and Todd, and we just rewrite a scene overnight and shoot it the next day. Like, you're proud of your insecurity with your product? Like, you're so insecure, you don't believe in what you wrote or what you're directing? Like, it's okay to make tweaks while you're on set. You're like, Okay, now we're here, this isn't working, let's try something else. But to rewrite whole scenes that's the movie feels like a fucking mess that's because it was made like a fucking mess like it's okay to deliver a line differently than you anticipated or reword it differently that happens it's great but to, but, but to change whole scenes on set be like you know what now that we're here and spent all the money on getting the set I'm not feeling it. Let's, let's, let's close up shop. Let's go somewhere else. Let's do another scene. Let's write it in two seconds. Because movie literally plays out like it was written by someone in two seconds. And it, that's the case. God, I really fucking hate Joker with all my heart. It is unbelievably bad. It's, it's the movie that people who are dumb and don't know movie... Like, you're not dumb because you don't know movies... You're only dumb when you don't know movies, but you try to act like you know movies by saying Joker's so, oh, it's a masterpiece. You just come off as an idiot who doesn't know anything of what, what the fuck you're talking about. Sad. And, yeah, that, that's my thoughts on Joker. Well, if you guys don't have anything else in the Q&A section, um, I think we can... Well, yep, uh, that, that checks off everything. I talked about all the movies I watched recently. I went on a lot of tangents before that. Went on a Joker tangent after. Sounds like a pretty good, successful day to me. So with all that being said, thank you. So much for watching, even if for no reason I decided to have technical difficulties three times in one recording session. Now you see why I fucking hate OBS with all my heart. It is the literal worst. So before this shit shuts down again, I'm just going to be very quick. Thank you so much for watching. If you're watching this from Twitch, follow me. You'll get notified whenever I go live. And you can tell by the title if it's just my random bullshit. Or if it's an actual podcast episode for once. I don't know when's the next time I'm going to do this because I'm still not motivated to talk about a movie proper. I'm only mo motivated to talk about, like, just 
a little bit of movies here and there. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, stay subscribed. I'll upload the next episode someday. And with all that being said, thank you. Keep watching. Keep safe. And keep watching movies.